Welcome to episode number 340 of the Beyond Social Media Show, the podcast for all of you marketing, advertising, public relations, and communications professionals. You can find us by searching for Beyond Social Media Show. We are recording on March 6, 2021. A lot of things to talk about this week, including stand-up TikTok, anything album covers, Twitter features, Taco Bell to go, LinkedIn features, YouTube features, the Microsoft email hack. And next week, uh, you'll want to tune in for BL's interview with David Berkowitz, who's had a stellar marketing career and has launched Serial Marketer, grown Serial Marketer, which is a Slack community of 2,000 people. A great interview, an amazing accomplishment, and and as I said, a stellar career. So it's a great interview with uh, David Berkowitz. You want to stick around for next week. Uh, And I have some news to announce. At the top of the show, I have... Accepted an offer from Thunheim Public Relations Agency, the agency that I actually first start, my first agency that I worked with. I'm returning to Thunheim um, starting this coming week. And um, uh, so it's one of the bigger agencies in the Twin Cities area, have a big public affairs uh, practice, and, uh, and I'm excited to start. So with that, we will dip into the topics and yell Always has the honors. What's the best story of the week this week, BL? Your new job. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so um, a lot has been happening with TikTok, um, but not on TikTok, outside of TikTok. TikTok's kind of busting out. So um, Amazon Prime Video has produced um, with uh, a cities in France um, tour, and Netflix has announced, and they've done it with uh, on TikTok. And it's playing, the TikTok is playing on Amazon Prime, which is a completely new thing. But uh, Netflix also launched a TikTok-like feed that's called Fast Laughs. And it's it's a new feature for its mobile apps. And it presents a string of, of comedy clips from its various uh, stand-up specials, TV series and movies. So um, on the Netflix app, uh, which is from a... Uh, Oh, goodness, I don't know which which is from where. Um, On the (laughs) the Netflix app, you can stop at any time and watch the full presentation, um, or you can continue, and or you can save them also. On the Amazon Prime series, it's written and directed by the French author and artist Abdi Al-Malik, and it shows a group of friends who are aged 15 to 25, perfect for TikTok, using the TikTok app to explore France's cultural highlights. And it's a dozen episodes up to 60 seconds long, and it runs on TikTok on the um, Prime video page on TikTok. So um, this is really fascinating. To cast the show, Prime Video launched the Prime Video Casting Challenge last December, and they asked users to reinterpret uh, something classic from French culture. And they got more than 45,000 participants and 105 million views on the applications. So um, that's a really interesting turn of events that uh, TikTok is being brought into other mediums. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, because there's a lot of interesting stuff happening on TikTok, I guess. Uh, people For sure. People want to grok that culture, one of which is, <laughs> I found this from BuzzFeed's Pauline Woodley, who reports that uh, there's a challenge on TikTok that, I don't know, it's much of a challenge. Um, people are making, uh, basically taking any random photo from your cam- from your, uh, from your um, camera um, roll and turning it into, editing it to turn it into an album album cover. So that's the latest TikTok trend. Uh, people are sharing these uh, these random fo- rando photos and, and making it uh, look like their album art. Um, I'm gonna try it, I'll share it next week. <laughs> Do they add music to it? Uh, some of them are videos apparently. I've only seen the, seen the photos and they are just random, really poorly shot photography that's That's really funny so um twitter has uh multiple new features and maybe's um they as as always with twitter these may or may not roll out but uh they may introduce some 
big features. Um, one of them is the ability to charge um, followers for access to additional content and the ability to create and join groups around specific interests. So, um, <laughs> you know, that, that either will or will not happen. This is from a Verge article um, by Jason Kastronakis. And um, the one about, um, this is my favorite thing. Uh, we will or will not soon have an edit button. Uh, well, not an edit button, excuse me. I think Jack Dorsey said that there would be an edit button when hell froze over, but they're testing an undo button. And that's from a story by Ben Lovejoy in 9 to 5. So uh, the payment feature called Super Follows lets Twitter users uh, charge followers to get extra content. And since they just signed up with review and you can do newsletters, I could see how that could connect. Um, but it could be bonus tweets, it could be access to a community group, a subscription to a newsletter, or a badge just indicating that you support that person. Uh, there's no timeline for either of these features, of course. And Twitter listed them on uh, as what's next for its platform during a presentation that it did for analysts and investors last week. And um, in a, uh, a mock-up screenshot on that call, uh, Twitter showed an example where a user charges $4.99 a month to receive, a user pays $4.99 a month to receive a, a series of perks. And uh, so Twitter said they see it as a way to let creators and publishers get paid directly by their fans. Um, they also announced uh, the communities, which of course, it's like Facebook groups where people can create and join groups and around specific interests like cats or plants, uh, which were a couple of their suggestions, um, allowing people to see more tweets focused on those topics. And, you know, of course, groups are the biggest thing on Facebook and a huge moderation problem as well, if we follow the news. And uh, they could be a particularly helpful tool on Twitter since the open-ended nature can really make it difficult for new users to, you know, get started. So uh, tipping or subscriptions ties into review and it's a path to monetization for creators, but um, Twitter could take a cut or not. Um, it's hard to imagine what exactly users would be willing to pay for in addition to regular tweets. It's impossible to say whether people would pay until we know exactly what they were going to pay for. Uh, Twitter would be asking them, you know, who knows? Uh, Twitter has yet to say anything uh, about this. So um, the Twitter edit button uh, is still a dream, but it's being tested. Uh, the um, undo button is being tested as a feature that would let you address the problem of typos. So you know how you spot a typo just as the tweet is tweeting? This would give you 10 seconds to edit it. Um, and basically it's done, it's meant for you to be able to fix the tweet. So in the test, there's a test example that I'll put in the show notes and um, there's a reverse progress bar that um, takes five or six seconds. And if you tap the button anytime in that period, you can cancel the tweet and edit it before you send it. So this would at least, you know, let you fix typos. Uh, it doesn't help you spot the error once you've tweeted it. And I can certainly see why there would be issues with an edit button. Um, and so this undo button thing sounds like a better idea to me. Uh, it's, it's certainly better than nothing. And as with all Twitter tests, there's no way to know how widely it might be offered, if or when it will ever happen. Well, when the news came, broke about the uh, the uh, the paid tweets or the purchased tweets or whatever we're going to call them anyway, yeah. um, the biggest there was a lot of backlash that I saw, and they, it it yeah. summed up in I ain't paying for no tweets. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> kind of makes sense. Why would I pay for a tweet? But uh, right. I see the tie. I see the tie with the review newsletter. It makes it. it there's a logical tie there. But here's a here's something a tweet kind of a tweet that people are. Uh, it's designed to be paid for, not just some random tweet that who knows whether it's of value. This is from a TechCrunch uh, article by Sarah Perez, uh, who reports that Twitter is experimenting with a new Twitter card format that it would include a big shop button. So this is specifically a social commerce designed uh, 
tweet, if you will, uh, that it would integrate product details directly into the tweet itself, uh, including the product name, the shop name, and product pricing. Um, and it is, uh, it's intended to be uh, an organic tweet focused on e-commerce rather than something that you would buy through Twitter's advertising platform. Well, that's definitely interesting. And I think every platform is looking to make shoppable content. You know, it's happening on YouTube. It's happening on Facebook. It's, and so Twitter's kind of late to the game, but um, that makes a lot of sense. So LinkedIn has a new feature. And uh, this is from the information from Amir Efradi. And uh, they're developing a new service that's called Marketplace. And it lets its 740 million users find and book freelancers. So it's pitting it against uh, publicly traded firms like Upwork and Fiverr. And um, it's another reason for us to pay uh, LinkedIn for something. So the booking service is supposed to launch uh, in fall 2021. And the focus is going to be on white collar services related to consulting, marketing, and writing. Uh, it may integrate with uh, the digital wallet that uh, Microsoft is developing. Uh, Facebook is also developing a service for booking freelancers focusing on physical work. So they want to compete with Angie's List um, because they're looking at things like housing repairs. But it may take a while for the freelancer product to move the, le the needle for LinkedIn. Um, it generated about $8.8 billion in revenue in 2020 from membership subscriptions and selling job-related ads, uh, in which is up 20% from 2019. And um, a spokesperson named Susie Owens says, in the future, we'll be building new ways to share more about the services you could offer directly through LinkedIn's profile. Um, it's expected to replace ProFinder, which charges $60 a month to read job proposals uh, posted by LinkedIn users, but that revenue is small and insignificant to the company, and uh, which leads me to believe that this new thing is going to be small and insignificant too. But um, the existing leaders in the freelance field, Upwork and Fiverr, last year they generated $550 million in revenue, which is their cut of the transaction. Uh, between engineers, designers, and uh, other professionals and the businesses that hired them for temporary work. So Upwork says it keeps about 13% of transactions as revenue and Fiverr says it keeps 27%. Collectively, both of those companies' revenue rose 37% uh, in 2020 compared to 2019. So, you know, one thing that's really clear, there's a ton, a lot of so, uh, freelancers looking for work and uh, how much we, we, we are willing to pay to uh, find it and what the quality of those leads is going to be is uh, up for debate. Yeah, my, uh, my experience with the LinkedIn um, kind of matchmaking service for, for um, people looking for freelance work versus the stuff that comes in has been underwhelming um there's been a there's been appropriate things that i that have been sent my other linkedin has notified um, me of but you know responding to it and getting any i've never got any business out of it basically so um i never got any business out of it either and what i found it to be was people who should have been on fiverr looking for yeah. the cheapest possible yeah, yeah. person you know who's going yeah. to do whatever should be five thousand dollars for 500 so yeah, yeah. um you know that's what this sounds like to me and i have no interest now yeah. uh this is not underwhelming uh a while ago linkedin uh rolled out stories um i toyed around with them, haven't used them that much on LinkedIn, but um, now, you know, every every social platform needs stories now and LinkedIn has them. Uh, but this uh, past week, they officially, this is from uh, David Cohen of Adweek, they officially rolled out uh, LinkedIn stories for pages, for LinkedIn pages. Uh, so there, you don't have to have a minimum number of followers for your pages to be able to use them. They are now available for all pages and all page admins. They immediately have access to a, to a swipe up feature. So you can guide readers to a URL, just like in, in Instagram, you can swipe up. Instagram, you need a certain number of followers. I think it's 10,000 followers before you get that uh, swipe up feature, but uh, LinkedIn is giving it to everybody. So you 
put in a URL to get pe to direct people to uh, somewhere else off LinkedIn uh, using the swipe up feature. LinkedIn stories for pages are available for 24 hours, like all, all stories, they're ephemeral, um, but they also enable private messaging. So that is another uh, 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 way of interacting with consumers that's gaining traction is just the private messaging through through the social channels through Instagram, especially. Uh, and so LinkedIn is following suit with that. And then there's another story uh, by Oliver Rist at PC magazine of how LinkedIn is is expanding pages with with linked with um, lead gen forms. So they're including lead gen forms with uh, as a feature of pages that you can plug directly in your product page for free. Um, so the lead gen forms allow you to gather data directly off your page rather than somebody sending somebody to a form on your website. Uh, when a LinkedIn member clicks on the product uh, that has lead gen form on it, the person's LinkedIn profile automatically updates in app uh, the form that they can then submit. So there's no, they don't need to fill anything out. All the information that, that is needed is on their LinkedIn profile. They just uh, tap in it, it's filled out and then they can, can submit it if they wanted to. Um, oh, I like as, that. That sounds good. It is good. As a, uh, as a page admin, then you can, from the, those lead gen forms, you can export the data into your uh, customer relationship uh, management systems, uh, lead management pipeline process, um, and these stories for pages are aimed not only at external audiences, but also you can you can earn uh, target them to your own employees too. So it's an internal communication mechanism as well. And then finally, one last LinkedIn uh, story. I got three this week, but since we're talking about LinkedIn, let's clump them all together. I noticed in the wild. I don't know if this is something that they're testing, but in my um, in my newsfeed, and I'll um, I'll include this on the in the show notes. I've got a um, a screen grab, uh, but within the, the My Network section, LinkedIn was recommending newsletters. So uh, you can tap and subscribe directly within LinkedIn to newsletters third parties are publishing. Um, I don't know how this works exactly, but I was surprised to see it and uh, I'll try and find out more about it. Oh, I can tell you a little bit more about it. There are people publishing newsletters directly on LinkedIn. Oh, so okay. I believe the ones they're recommending are the ones that are uh, on LinkedIn go, and by people sense. in your network. Yeah, I think that's I think that's what that is. They started that a couple of months ago. Okay. Um, I haven't seen a lot of them, but but there definitely are uh, are some. So in terms of new features, uh, <laughs> YouTube's got some and they're kicking off features for creators and they say they, just a mild um, uh, claim here that they're gonna change the way the world experiences video, <laughs> nothing big. Um, they, um, this is from the YouTube blog and it's from uh, YouTube's um, product chief, Neil Mohan. And he just rolled out all these features that are coming up soon. Uh, the new video creation tools in shorts, a TikTok, and they launched this month. Um, they've been beta tested in India, and the shorts player in India is now receiving more than 3.5 daily, 3.5 billion daily global views. Uh, there's also new tipping and other monetization features and shopping tools that promise even more revenue for creators. So everybody in big tech is imitating everybody else. And one more thing that I didn't have in the show notes, but WhatsApp is introducing, um, uh, wh what do you call it when nobody can see it? Um, private um, video calls on desktop only. Um, and uh, what is that called? I can't think of the word. Um, encoded in case with the you know when nobody can see them encrypted <laughs> but, uh, encrypted right but uh, you know and, and they're saying we can't see them yeah right and this just does not sound like what the world needs now more things you can't see on youtube sorry i don't think so <laughs> so um 20 episodes ago bl you and i talked about um taco bell and other restaurants refitting themselves to uh, account for the covid age um, and uh, this is an update on that story. This is from Star Tribune's Tim Harlow, who reports that Brooklyn Park, Minnesota is the first city in, the, in our state to get the new Taco Bell to go concept restaurants. Um, 
you order as you remember you order on a mobile app and then drive through to pick up a lot of restaurants are retrofitting this way um but so the 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 taco bell to go concept will not just be mobile order pickup you will be able to walk in and place an order to go at a counter but there's no dine-in uh setting uh or seating uh it's a two-story restaurant concept with four drive-through lanes. So one line is reserved for traditional customers who want to order off the menu board and then pick it up and pay for it at the window. Um, and then the three other lanes are reserved for customers using the app to order in advance and then pick up or to accommodate like the grub hubs of the world food delivery services. Um, they will have two kitchens. These concepts have two kitchens. A first floor kitchen will be used to uh, prepare the orders for people for people who use the traditional drive through lane and walk in customers and then all the other orders will be prepared in the second floor kitchen that is above the pickup lanes and the food will be sent to the customers through like pneumatic tubes that you use at banks <laughs> so i imagine taco bells is going to be buying up a bunch of old banks with the with the uh, <laughs> drive through lanes already well, when I saw that in your notes and I saw Brooklyn, I thought, well, that's clever. People in Brooklyn don't have cars, but <laughs> you're talking about Minnesota. Well, I'll never find that out because I am never going to be eating at Taco Bell. I think we agreed on that the last yeah. time we discussed Taco <laughs> Bell. <laughs> so I'm out of good news. Do you have more? Uh, that's it. That's it. We're on the bad. Oh, well, bad, bad, bad news. Uh, more than 30,000 uh, people who use Microsoft email servers were hacked by Chinese hackers, at least 30,000 organizations in the United States, including a significant number of small businesses, towns, cities, and local governments in the past few days have been hacked by an unusually aggressive Chinese cyber espionage unit. And what they want is to uh, steal email. That's what they're into. Um, and this is from a Krebs cyber, uh, a Krebs, uh, Krebs cyber security um, uh, story. And uh, it's terrifying. And uh, Microsoft blog also addressed it and uh, Krebs on security, sorry. And um, Microsoft blog, uh, you know, addressed it and said they're working on it. But all the victims use Microsoft Exchange to process their email. And Microsoft said the flaws were being targeted by a previously unidentified Chinese hacking crew that it called Hafnium. And it said that they've been conducting targeted attacks on email systems in a whole wide range of industry sectors, including infectious disease researchers, law firms, higher education institutions, defense contractors, policy think tanks, and NGOs. And I heard a press conference from the White House in which they are uh, looking into which government agencies are affected. And so Microsoft says duh, the best protection is to apply updates as soon as possible across all infected systems. And uh, the espionage group is exploiting four newly discovered flaws in Microsoft Exchange server email software. And they have uh, seeded hundreds of thousands of victim organizations worldwide with these tools that give the attackers total remote control over the infected systems. Um, Microsoft had uh, uh, issued security updates on March 1st, but since then, the group stepped up its attacks and, and, and uh, started going after state and local governments. And so Microsoft says, we continue to help customers by providing additional investigation and mitigation guidance. Impacted customers should contact our support team. Yeah, good luck with that. And um, meanwhile, um, uh, there's an emergency directive ordering all civilian departments and agencies running vulnerable Microsoft Exchange servers to either get this update to software or disconnect their products from the networks. So. Go home and wait until this is over. I guess was that what that meant? Well, I mean that that's that's Microsoft Exchange Server is like a standard operating technology for a lot of major companies. Um, yeah, that's a big that's a big breach. I kind of feel like um, it should be the policy of the government to 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 address this. Not in the. I, I almost feel like it should be an offensive. Uh, 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 um, practice, like make it too painful to do these types of uh, 
because it's you know it's, it's state actors um you gotta make it painful for them i don't know how else well, to deal. Sure you can't trying. always just be defending against it can't always be defending against it well i don't know in the past four years i don't know if we've been trying at all so right exactly it doesn't appear that we have okay well that's all my bad news thank goodness all right we're on to what smiles next yeah, because that, that would be notes. appropriate after bad news. Yeah, really. Um, OK, so this is not new, but it's probably the funniest ad ever. And someone sent it to me this week. It's still hilarious. Twelve million views later. It's from Hayes Baked Beans. And um, apropos the, the Mars landing, it shows um, it shows astronauts on the moon or Mars, wherever they are. And these huge monsters pop up and start squishing the astronauts. And this one astronaut goes and hides behind a rock and the monster doesn't see him and it starts to walk away, whereupon the astronaut farts. <laughs> and it says, Hayes beans, not for astronauts. <laughs> what are you, seven years old? Are you a seven year old boy, BL? <laughs> Yes, I think so. <laughs> you have one? I don't. That's more than well. One. This <laughs> well, this one is uh, dangerous adventures with Daddy. Uh, this is a guy in Belgium, and he created this viral Instagram account to prank his girlfriend um, because she's she was at work and and he was at home. He's apparently a, a sound. A uh, designer and a concert, and he did concerts for a local uh, youth group. And you know he's been out of work, and so uh, <laughs> he um, he was getting messages from his girlfriend all day long. You know, are you is the baby okay? Is the baby okay? So while he was at home not working, he decided to learn Photoshop, and so he set up. This is from a story in the Daily Mail UK by Sam Baker, and um, so to prank his girlfriend who was worried, uh, the guy's name is Kenny. Do and he's um, he, he he started to put his daughter um, in in uh, dangerous situations in Photoshop. So um, she would text about the baby, and he would send back these prank responses. So his Instagram account has since gone worldwide, uh, and it's got more than one hundred twenty four thousand subscribers. So some of the pictures show their daughter holding a drill, um, operating a circular saw. Uh, putting her hand in a plug socket, uh, my favorite, walking across a tightrope over a ravine or uh, climbing a, a fridge. Uh, and then there's one where she's sitting on the stove with a frying pan and a spatula in her hand. And um, other ones show her doing chores like vacuuming the floor. So he says, I now take a picture every week. And in many photos, I just hold Alex and then I chop myself out. And uh, then I add a specific background to create a dangerous situation. And he sends these to his girlfriend at work. <laughs> that sounds like a relationship that's not going to last very long. <laughs> Actually, they're having another baby, so he'll have two to do this with soon. <laughs> <laughs> kind of makes, so makes me want to uh, learn, learn Photoshop better. Yeah, right, doesn't it? I mean, yeah. you can do that with your cats. Right. <laughs> so um, <laughs> we're on to cool cool tools or new stuff. And I've got a, a cool tool, a new new cool tool to me. Uh, it's not entirely new, but this is a Spark Toro uh, by Rand Fishkin. Rand Fishkin is, uh, was the founder of Moz. He has gone on to found uh, his uh, Spark Toro company and, uh, and launched this uh, fantastic audience intelligence tool. Um, so you there's you, you have several search options among them are my audience frequently frequently talks about and then you enter your keyword. Uh, my audience uses these words in their profile. My audience follows this social account, in which case you'd put in you know BS media show. Uh, my audience frequently visits this website. My audience frequently uses this hashtag. Uh, and then analyze specific website or social account and hit enter and you get your results. And the results are fantastic. So there's an overview, there's audience insights that's in, that includes a ton of stuff, um, but am, I'm just among them are political sharing activity of that audience, uh, factual sharing activity, how factual is the information that they're sharing, 
political social following, which I found interesting because I've never seen a tool that that breaks it down like this. Um, and then there's uh, there's a social accounts uh, audience engages with section, websites audience engages with, podcast audience engages with, YouTube channels audience engages with, and media wow. audience. Uh, it gauges with. So it breaks down a bunch of different things that you would want to know about the audience you're trying to reach. And if it is, you know, if you're, if you're uh, um, researching competition, you're getting an idea of what, uh, what their audience looks like. If you're looking to find uh, media that you want to do earn media with, then I mean, it's a great tool. So the, the pricing is great too. There's a free account. It's 10 searches per month you get with a free account. It's a sampling of results. Uh, you can create a single list for your research. Uh, you get social contact data and only one user can use it. Can use it. Um, but then pricing goes up from $38 a month to $225 a month, uh, depending on you know, like a solo, solo business to, uh, to a major agency. You get more li site licenses, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But really cool tool. So um, I'll put a link to it in the show that notes so people can try it out. Great. It is, it is. That sounds really great. So um, this is also really great. And this is a mother load of tools. Um, this is 50 tools and resources for journalists. And it's by Jeremy Kaplan uh, via Pointner. And uh, it has apps to sharpen your word choices, crop your photos, of course, on online privacy and a whole lot more. Just absolutely extraordinary list of, of tools, many of which I'd never seen before. Uh, do you have another one, Dave? I don't. Um, okay, so Google added <laughs> more more new features. Uh, uh, Google Meet has added a green room, and uh, this is via Peggy K, who um, says that Google Meet has added this green room where you can check your camera and your mic before you enter a meeting, and it's available only on desktop. And it's really interesting because when you open the the Meet before you go in, you see your camera and your mic like you do on any app. But now there's an option to click check your audio and video. And when you do that, you can make sure that you're using the camera and the mic you want and you have the option to change them. But more importantly, when you click the next button, you can make a test video. And so you have 10 seconds to make a test so you can check your sound, your light, your, you know, your background. And then you click the X at the top right of your test video, which Google says nobody will ever see. And then you have the option to go into the room once you're satisfied with how you look and how your light is. That's a really good thing. That is so smart. That should every video conferencing platform. Yeah, should I don't have know that. why they don't. That's so smart. Yeah, I mean the clip of you know making the clip is the is yeah. the thing that nobody else has, and it's yep. really that's brilliant. That's cool. Yeah. Uh, so where does that bring us? On to politics. You've got a couple of interesting ones. I do. Um, uh, Barack Obama and Bruce Springsteen have a new podcast, and um, it's only on Spotify. They've only done two episodes, but it's fantastic fantastic and and they're just talking they're talking about their lives they're talking about you know things that are happening and um it's you really have to hear it and of course springsteen's playing music and um you know he's playing the guitar while obama's talking and and, and there's background music it's wonderful and the other one is uh, Kara Swisher uh, of the New York Times interviews uh, Stacey Abrams and Stacey Abrams is a national treasure and um, she tells Kara Swisher that she's playing a long game in, in her, the conversation about American idealism and American betrayal. <clears throat> it's on uh, Kara Swisher's Sway podcast and that's via the New York Times but it's on every uh, podcast platform. And among the other things that uh, they discuss, um, Abrams' political playbook, uh, she says she expects, uh, she talks about the states that she thinks will turn blue in 2024 and whether she thinks the former Georgia Senator Kelly Loeffler, um, uh, who uh, shares, okay, what? Thinks that the former Georgia Senator Kelly Loeffler's so-called voting rights group shares her mission of expanding voter access. Um, well, you know, we'll find out about that. But I mean, anything that Stacey Abrams says, I want to hear. And Kara Swisher is the penultimate interviewer. She does not ask simple questions. She's, you know, she's a tough interviewer and a great interviewer. And you really want to subscribe to and listen to her podcast. She's great. Very cool. Uh, I have a pro tip. 
This is from the aforementioned uh, Ram Fishkin, who was a speaker at a recent Minnesota search, uh, search Engine Marketing Association event. They do, I can't say enough about the volunteers there. They do a fantastic job. So they brought in Ram Fishkin to, uh, to uh, talk during our monthly uh, happy hour virtual meeting event thingy. And uh, he's great. Um, he uh, he talked about uh, engagement on social media and optimizing for engagement. And so he, he started by saying, think about what the social channels want. And this is most applicable to Facebook and Instagram, which obviously is owned by Facebook, uh, a little, somewhat to LinkedIn, less so to Twitter, but even so on Twitter, it's applicable. But they want you to stay there. They don't want you to leave the channel, right? So Facebook wants you to stay on Facebook or Instagram. Uh, LinkedIn wants you to stay on LinkedIn. Twitter wants you to stay on Twitter, less so because that's a journalism thing. So people are always sharing links. But anyway, basic concept is stay there. That's how they measure growth. More people on the site, more of the time, more ad inventory to sell, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So you know what they want, give them what they want. Don't put links in your status updates, in your posts. Don't include links. Don't send people somewhere else. Find out what your audience engages with, what content um, your audience engages with. So as you're experimenting with the kind, you know, think about what, what you think will be emotionally resonant or, or fascinating to people and make people want to like and then comment and, and share your, your posts. And, uh, and when you get one that explodes and, uh, and has a lot of uh, engagement around it, then pay attention to that and say, okay, do more of that type of content on your next post. So what, you're, what he's saying is you should create an engagement streak is what he calls it. So one, this post uh, created a lot of engagement, do more of that. And that previous engagement is gonna apply to the next post, which is like it and boost that post and then do another one. And that'll boost, you're, you're kind of drafting on the posts, the engagement of the previous posts. And then at the end of the third one, put your call to action and send them off site to do what you want them to do. But build up that momentum basically on, of, of engagement so that you're, you're, you're hijacking the algorithm uh, that, is, that is engagement. And then you get a large enough audience where you can monetize it by sending them somewhere else. I thought it was a really, really smart uh, a way of thinking about social. That is brilliant. And I, I saw recently a study, I can't remember exactly where, uh, saying that tweets that don't have links get more engagement. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I've noticed this on mine, like I, I've recently had like, you know, one sentence comments sometimes that, that I've made on a post and or, or ask a quick question and, you know, get 50,000 um, responses or shares and, and um, they didn't have links in them. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, that's a really interesting concept. I, I have to try that. Yeah. Yeah. I like uh, that. So let's wrap this up with some numbers. This is uh, from Bizarre Voice. 62% um, of people say customer photos influence purchase decisions. Uh, Bizarre, Bizarre Voices survey results included shoppers from the US, Canada, Australia, France, Germany, and the UK. And uh, so some of the details here, reasons adults worldwide look for extra information and context when digitally shopping. 24% um, said it may highlight something that wasn't obvious. 21% uh, said they like to see a product in action before they buy. 17% said they feel more confident that the reviews are accurate. 17% said it's easier to see the quality of a product. 11% uh, said it's easier to see the size, fit, or color of a product. And 7% uh, said it's easier to see the material of a product. But I mean, think about it. You see uh, obviously consumer-generated content about a product. Um, it's going to lend more. It's going to make you trust that product more than, than you would otherwise. I always look for those yeah. in the reviews. Yeah. You know, I, I always read the reviews and look for the pictures and some people send videos and 
Unfortunately, those are usually negative reviews, uh, you know, talking about how I turned the thing on and it exploded or <laughs> have pictures of it or, you know, I had a toy for my dog and in half an hour it ate the whole thing. I mean, that kind of thing. But, you know, and then I won't buy it because there's the picture right there. You can't, you know, that's worth a thousand words. So that brings us to the end of episode 340 of the Beyond Social Media Show. We've been doing this for eight years, Dave. Mm -hmm. and, uh, <laughs> and so I'm here with Dave Erickson, who is on Twitter as D Erickson. He's on Instagram as D E Erickson. He's on YouTube as E Strategy, and he blogs at e strategyblog.com, which you really should check out. I'm B.L. Ackman. I'm What's Next on Twitter. My blog is What's Next Blog. My YouTube channel is What's Next Blog. Uh, I have a website at blockman.com and on Instagram, I have Lucy the Rescue Puppy. The Beyond Social Media Show is online at beyondsocialmediashow.com. And after the show, you will find the video and the show notes with links to everything we discussed on the show. On Twitter, where we hope you'll follow us, we're at BS Media Show. And you can listen to Beyond Social Media Show wherever you get your podcasts. Uh, and you can also tell your, um, your Google um, speaker, your Google, what is she called? <laughs> she we, who can't be named. Google yeah, Home. You just tell her. Google Home. You tell Google Home, play Beyond Social Media Show. And next week, we will feature my interview with... David um, Berkowitz, who is the founder of the Serial Marketer community of 2000 marketers. And we thank you for watching today. Thanks for watching. <laughs>